Welcome back to another episode of The Damage Report. I'm John Adarola. We are thrilled to once again have on the show, Congressman Ro Khanna is gonna be joining us. He has been leading up the House side of the effort to stop Donald Trump from throwing us into a war with Iran. He's gonna be joining us to break down the strategy going forward. I'm very excited to hear about that. And we also have Emma Viglin of Rebel HQ. She's gonna be joining us to break down some big news of the day, including developments in the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren back and forth in advance of the debate tonight. Also, a bit of a change up at The View, who spent the morning attacking Bernie Sanders as well. So we're gonna be discussing that in addition. And a little update on the status of the wall. Donald Trump desperately wants more money for it. He's not gonna be given that money, and so he apparently is going to just take it once again. We're gonna give you the specifics though. But before all of that, I do wanna give you an update in advance of the little developments around impeachment that are supposed to happen sometime this week, so let's do that. According to senior White House officials, they now believe that there might well be enough Senate Republicans that will cross over and vote with the Democrats to allow for witnesses to be called in the impeachment trial. That is, hopefully we're gonna be moving a little bit closer sometime this week when managers are called on the House floor. So let's give you some specifics about some of the names that might pop up in this area. So last week, Senator Collins said she was working with a fairly small group of GOP senators to allow new testimony, adding that her colleagues, quote, should be completely open to calling witnesses. Mitt Romney has expressed an interest in hearing from former National Security Advisor John Bolton, who has said he would testify under subpoena. Lisa Murkowski said last week that the Senate should proceed as it did during the 1999 Clinton impeachment trial. And the White House also views Rand Paul of Kentucky as a wild card, and Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee as an institutionalist who might vote to call witnesses, as one official put it. And rarely has the word institutionalist borne so much weight as it does there, because it can only be taken to mean one of two and perhaps both of these things. One, that as an institutionalist, he respects like the Senate and what the Senate's supposed to do and what the Constitution says the obligations and duties of senators will be. And so he's an institutionalist, whereas these other Senate Republicans are just bowing down to unitary executive power. That's the only way I can really take it. Um, alternatively, like he's been around for a bit and so he understands that in these trials, they always call witnesses always, always, always. And it is a bizarre ahistorical take to pretend that it would be weird to do that now. So I don't know exactly which way they're using that word. And I don't often agree with Lamar Alexander, but in this case, consider me too an institutionalist. If they're gonna have the trial, they should take it at least as seriously as they did back during the 90s. And they called witnesses even for that. So in terms of how many need to cross over, understand that a simple majority of 51 votes will be needed to approve motions to call witnesses, meaning Democrats will need to convince four out of the 53 Republicans in the Senate to vote with them to compel testimony. Now I had not had coming into this week much faith that that was going to happen. This new reporting implies that it might well happen, but how? How important that is, how consequential that is, that is a very different question. I, look, I honestly think one of the reasons that so much of the commentary leading up to the Senate trial has focused around the witnesses is honestly, it's like an expression of how sad and small this entire thing has become. The expectation that anything substantive will happen to Donald Trump, that this will in any way constrain his power, that has so fled the coop that we're all just now saying, ah, what's John Bolton gonna say? And so let's talk about that briefly then, if that's the big question. Because hypothetically, there are any number of different witnesses that can be called, even the same people who spoke before House committees. They could conceivably come back and either reiterate what they previously said or perhaps be led to reveal something new. We don't know that there is anything new to be revealed. With John Bolton, he is sort of like, He's the X factor because he hasn't spoken yet. And he didn't initially want to. In fact, Donald Trump wanted him to be barred from doing so and might well still bar him from speaking if he were to line up to speak before the Senate. What would John Bolton actually have to say? Now, I'm gonna leave aside the concern that Donald Trump's renewed apparent interest in conflict with Iran means that John Bolton might be feeling a little bit more defensive towards Donald Trump. But John Bolton, look, he initially raised concern about what he was seeing vis-a-vis the shadow diplomacy with Ukraine, that is true. And so to some extent, he was one of the early important figures in making this a story. But that said, 
he left before it became the full blown scandal that it was. And so while I think that John Bolton hypothetically could bring some sort of new information to this, he might have been involved in conversations that so far no one who testified did. First of all, I don't trust John Bolton, no one should trust John Bolton. And he is unlikely to have any information about the actual breaking of the law. He might have been involved in some of the conversations about the planning for it. That might be interesting in some fashion. But we already know so much more. And while I do think that there is value to repetition, I think that having the same witnesses that spoke before the House speak in front of the Senate could drive home the importance of this scandal again, what it represents, Donald Trump's willingness to sell out both our foreign policy and the integrity of our elections for his own personal political gain, that has value. I don't know how much extra John Bolton would actually bring. So we might have the witnesses, John Bolton might be one of those. But even if that happens, I really would not expect too much to come from that. One interesting potential additional X factor though, is that Rudy Giuliani, who has acted as Trump's attorney for free since early 2018, has been quote, working Trump hard to be included among the lawyers who will defend him on the floor of the Senate, according to an informal advisor close to the White House. That is bad news potentially for Donald Trump if he goes along with that because Rudy Giuliani can't defend himself on a cable news show, let alone a president in a Senate trial. I don't think there's basically any chance that Donald Trump ends up getting removed from office. But if there is a chance, you could file that under Rudy Giuliani and what he might bring to it. He said this, I'd try the case, I'd love to try the case. I don't know if anybody would have the courage to give me the case, but if you give me the case, I will prosecute it as a racketeering case. But it's not just like a trial that you can make about whatever you want. You're not in charge, buddy. It's the Senate that's in charge, unfortunately, the Senate Republicans. But no matter what, you don't get to choose what the charges are. Nobody would have the courage to give me the case. Is it really about courage? I mean, I guess it would be bold, but like putting like a Bengal tiger in charge, it would be bold too. It's not necessarily good or productive. So anyway, look, my hopes for the future of this impeachment proceeding are very low. At the best, John Bolton being involved might spice things up just a smidge. Rudy Giuliani being involved might make it a new scandal. God only knows what he would admit on the national stage. But it is unlikely to be substantive or for this to in any way actually provide consequences for Donald Trump and his clear illegal acts last year. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. We come back, Congressman Ro Khan is gonna join us. Uh, the most important topic we'd be talking about right now is the future of US-Iranian relations. We're gonna have that for you after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be. Featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, The UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Over the past year, Donald Trump has twice brought us to the brink of possible war with Iran, and he still has a good bit of his first term to go. If he's gonna be stopped from bringing us there for the third time, some sort of big action is gonna need to be taken. And there are a few responsible politicians that are pushing in that direction. We are joined now on the Damage Report by one such politician, Representative Ro Khanna, welcome back to the Damage Report. Great to be back on. 
Uh, good to have you here, uh, couldn't have picked a better time to speak with you. Before we talk about the future, I, I do wanna talk with the, about the recent past because in the recent reauthorization of the National Defense Authorization Act, um, you attempted to push through an amendment that in my view could have potentially avoided the tension of the past few weeks. Um, do you think that if you had been successful, if it had not been struck down, that we might have avoided some of the great loss of life of the past few weeks? Yes, I do. We had an amendment that would have cut off funding for any offensive strike into Iran or against an Iranian official. That passed the House overwhelmingly, including with 27 Republicans, some of the president's closest allies like Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan and Matt Gates supported the uh, amendment. It was stripped from the conference committee bill and the Congress then voted to give the Pentagon $738 billion a huge defense increase without any restriction on their ability to go to Iran. I believe giving the Pentagon that blank check gave them the confidence to recommend uh, as brazen an attack as the assassination of Soleimani to the president. Had we not given them that blank check or had that amendment been in there, there's no way in my view that the Pentagon would have even recommended that option to Trump. Well, considering over the past few years how outspoken most elected Democrats have been about the threat that Donald Trump poses in a number of different areas, why in this area, when it comes to his authority, the funding for the military, have so many Democrats been so deferential in giving him what he wants, giving him the freeway and the funding to do what he wants in this area? There's still a fear in this country of being labeled weak on national security, weak on terrorism. Uh, every day you have Republicans getting up and giving speeches saying that the Democrats are sympathetic to Iran or cheering for terrorists. The difference though is that that rhetoric doesn't work anymore. Most Americans realize that the war on terror hasn't succeeded, that terrorism has spread, that trillions of dollars have been wasted. And while that kind of scare tactic may have worked in 2002, 2003, shortly after 9-11, now I think we should be much more confident in confident in saying that we're the party that's gonna end these endless wars, we're gonna exercise military restraint, and we're gonna invest in our country in education, infrastructure, healthcare, instead of giving over 50% of the federal budget, the discretionary federal budget to defense. So, um, and now we come to the, the, the current uh, conflict uh, that hopefully has simmered down for now. Um, over the past week, the rationale for why Qasem Soleimani needed to be killed has shifted pretty fast. Um, yesterday, Donald Trump tweeted that it didn't even matter if he posed an imminent threat. I, I'm curious, did you believe that there was intelligence um, that justified this targeted killing? Uh, and if not, what do you believe was the actual stimulus for this action? I think Donald Trump finally uh, told uh, close to the truth when he said we went after him because he was a bad guy. I mean, the reality is Soleimani had engaged in uh, leading uh, offensive uh, initiatives against Americans. Uh, he had been responsible for American debts in Iraq and other places. And there have been people in the administration uh, who have blamed Iran and this regime uh, going all the way back to the hostage crisis. And they, for them, uh, Iran's uh, actions against Americans, against some of their colleagues uh, or people who they knew who served were very personal. And so this was an attack that they viewed as a retaliation or as avenging the loss of uh, other Americans. Uh, I don't believe that it was wise because the reason George W. Bush or Obama didn't do it is that it would perpetuate the cycle of violence and put Americans at greater risk. But regardless if you have my view of whether it was wise, it certainly required congressional authorization. The president should have come to Congress and said, uh, Soleimani is a bad guy, he's killed Americans, and I want your authority to go to, to war with Iran to take out their number two or number three leader. Of course, the reason he didn't do that is he knows that Congress would never have given him that authority. You know, I think you're right to point out that in this area, this is something that past presidents, um, they did not act in this particular area. Um, but uh, President Obama, he was. He did use our military quite freely in a number of circumstances abroad, drone strikes and things like that, including against US citizens. Do you, I, I assume that it is fairly speculative at this point, but if, if the Democrats had been more restrictive on the use of executive power in that area under a Democratic president, do you think that that would make the mission of constraining the power of a Republican president a little bit easier if they had been willing to tamp down on the use of this sort of authority when it was a Democrat that occupied the White House? I think in general, if Congress was willing to use the power of the purse, we'd be able to clamp down on 
unconstitutional wars, whether it was a Republican or Democrat. One area where we should have been more assertive is in the war with Libya. Uh, Jim McGovern, Representative McGovern from Massachusetts had a war powers resolution to say that we should not have been able to, to take action against Libya uh, without congressional authorization. Now I get that in that case, there was uh, the UN authorization and China and Iran were, uh, uh, China and Russia were behind it. And it, the US troops were part of NATO's troops. But I still believe that we should have stood up for requiring uh, congressional authorization. So uh, I definitely think you can argue that the Congress hasn't been uh, strong enough in asserting our uh, war power uh, responsibility, both in Democratic and Republican administrations. So Trump is going to be president for about a year, even if he loses the next general election. Um, do you think that this is the last uh, time that we've gone to the brink with Iran? Or do you fear that he could once again, perhaps in the lead up to the election, uh, you know, stimulate some sort of tension between us and Iran? And if so, um, what needs to be done to lower the chance of that happening? I'm fearful. Uh, look, I believe that the president probably doesn't want to send troops into a full fronted war in Iran, that's not the risk. The risk is that these skirmishes, these accidental uh, confrontations or intentional confrontations could very easily escalate out of control. We're very fortunate that no Americans lost their lives in the Iranian uh, strike. But imagine if Americans had lost their lives, uh, there would have been a requirement almost for the president to, to then escalate and take uh, further action. Uh, and it, who knows whether that response would have been proportionate. So you can easily imagine a scenario where these things spiral out of control. And that's why Congress has to act. And the only real power we have is the power of the purse. We can actually say we simply will not fund offensive strikes against Iran or Iranian officials. Uh, and that uh, if we don't authorize the funding for that, it would be impossible for this president to carry it out. That's how we wound down the Vietnam War. Senator Church had an amendment that basically said, we're just gonna stop funding any troops in Vietnam other than for their withdrawal. That's how we stopped a war in Angola in 1976. Uh, so the Congress has this power. The question is whether we will exercise it. So I mean, that that must be my question then as well. Like you've been consistent in this issue across multiple conflicts over multiple years. Um, we know that the Democratic Party they were very outspoken against Donald Trump over the past two weeks. Well, now they have a a chance to potentially do something significant, and perhaps along the lines that you laid out. Is that going to happen? And and if it does in the House, is it possible that the Senate, perhaps with the assistance of some relatively anti-war Republicans like Mike Lee or others, that, that they might go along with it? I do think there's a good possibility. I, I spoke today with our leadership and they are committed to moving my bill in the next week or two and getting a vote on it. And I anticipate it will pass the House and that would strip any funding for any offensive war in Iran. Of course, Senator Bernie Sanders is leading that effort uh, in the Senate. Uh, Senator Sanders and I have an op-ed out on CNN's webpage today that you can look at, which makes the case for why we need it to pass both the House and the Senate and need a strong congressional response. Mike Lee has already said, Senator Republican Mike Lee, that he will co-sponsor Bernie Sanders' bill. I'm hopeful Rand Paul and a few others will get on board. So there is an emerging bipartisan coalition to stop these wars. Uh, and it's encouraging to see the support that Senator Sanders and my bill is getting. Well, uh, I hope that you're successful. I know that uh, a lot of people are still very worried about what the future might bring between the US and Iran as long as Donald Trump is president. So uh, Godspeed in your effort, uh, Congressman Khanna. Thank you, thank you for covering these uh, important issues. Thank you, and thank you for joining us as always. We're gonna take a short break here. Uh, when we come back, Emma Viglin is gonna be joining us to break down some of the big news of the day after this. <music> Heading into an incredibly important debate before the Iowa caucus. Unfortunately, the biggest story today on the Democratic side is the feud between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And there are some developments there that we wanna break down. When I say we, I mean me and Emma Vigland who joins us now. Emma, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, John. Glad to have you here. Uh, sorry to hear that you're sick. Uh, my heart goes out to you because I have been sick for what feels like my entire life, so. 
I, I heard you coughing uncontrollably on the main show. So good job, yeah, John's yeah. body. And uh, I have not recovered since then. Uh, so <laughs> look, I know that this is your favorite story ever. So let's let's launch into it. So initially yesterday, CNN reports that uh, four <laughs> people, uh, none of whom were in the meeting, said that Bernie Sanders had a meeting with Elizabeth Warren last year where he said that a woman could not win uh, the presidential election. Which is an interesting stance for him to take considering he has worked to help women beat Donald Trump as Hillary Clinton did by three million votes. So anyway, in response to that story, Bernie Sanders initially responded before Warren did. He said, it's ludicrous to believe that at the same meeting where Elizabeth Warren told me she was going to run for president, I would tell her that a woman wouldn't, couldn't win. What I did say that night was that Donald Trump is a sexist, a racist, and a liar who would weaponize whatever he could. And so following that, we waited to see, would Elizabeth Warren weigh in? Would she confirm or deny the account? And indeed, she did. I'm not gonna read her entire statement, but she did say this, you can take a look at it. Uh, among the topics that came up was what would happen if Democrats nominated a female candidate. I thought a woman could win, he disagreed. I have no interest in, fur in discussing this private meeting any further because Bernie and I have far more in common than our differences on punditry. So we now have a response. Um, Emma, what do you think about Warren's statement? Well, she has no interest in discussing it further because it helps her and mm -hmm. she's falling in the polls and he's surging in the polls. Uh, I'm super bummed about this entire thing, as you can probably tell. I, 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 I have no doubt that there's a kernel of truth in her statement. I doubt she would come up with this out of whole cloth. I, I mean, I, I don't think she's Machiavellian in that way. Um, but I'm sure the context was, how horrible is it that a woman might have a harder time becoming president because this country is so sexist, la di da. She chose not to put any of that context in her response because again, it helps her politically while throwing her friend of many years under the bus. Mm -hmm. um, so what the, what I would have thought would have been an appropriate response, even if her memory uh, tells her that that he actually said that and she doesn't want to to deny the report entirely, she could say, uh, this CNN report was based on four people uh, or came from four, uh, four sources who were not in the meeting. It was just Bernie and myself. The context of the conversation was entirely left out. Bernie Sanders has been a fighter for women, women for decades and decades in the House and the Senate and, and as a presidential candidate. So uh, I, I would like to put this behind me. But instead, she merely kind of did a a drive by where she confirmed the report and said, I don't want to discuss it further, uh, which which is uh, when mm -hmm. I'm beha behaving more petulantly in like a fight with my boyfriend, that's what <laughs> I'll do. But yeah. that, that, that's, that's, it's not, not a good way to be, it's not mature. And it also <laughs> like, even if it was totally honest, it's like, I don't want to discuss it further, case closed. The debate's tomorrow, it's not case closed. It, you don't right. get to make it case closed, even if that's what you wanted and we can sincerely doubt whether that's, what you actually want. I want to add on one other bit of new reporting. The Washington Post had an article about this and they said two people with knowledge of the conversation at the 2018 dinner at Warren's home told the Washington Post that Warren brought up the issue by asking Sanders whether he believed a woman could win. One of the people with knowledge of the conversation said Sanders did not say a woman couldn't win, but rather that Trump would use nefarious tactics against the Democratic nominee. Now look, I honestly, that a person with knowledge of the, in no case does that really mean anything. It means they talked to Bernie or they talked to Warren, they weren't there. But my stance before Warren's statement and after it is, I simply do not believe that she said, yeah, I'm gonna run, I think a woman could win. And he said, no, that's dumb, a woman, woman, well, woman <laughs> couldn't win. There's no way that's what he said. He obviously said Trump will attack a woman. I mean, he was already attacking Warren in a particularly weird, misogynistic and racist fashion. And the, the thing about this topic that's so weird is uh, him acknowledging that a woman has a harder path because of how inherently sexist American society is and always has been, everybody has to attack that. Because the implication seems to then be, well, in that case, let's not nominate a woman because it'd be harder for them to win. Even though those same people will then turn around and say, yeah, Trump is running an obviously misogynistic campaign in 2016 against Hillary Clinton. And we all know he'd do it again. Saying that a woman has a harder path is not saying we should not nominate a woman. That simply does not follow. But we do have to acknowledge that sexism is an inherent fact of America. It always has been and for probably a long time it will be. And we have to acknowledge it if we're gonna fight against it. 
Yeah, exactly. And once again, all reporting indicates that Bernie Sanders was pushing Elizabeth Warren to run in 2016 to challenge Hillary Clinton from the left. And when she said she wasn't going to do so, because reports indicate that Hillary Clinton and Hillary Clinton had basically tried to neutralize Elizabeth Warren in a sense. And they had this pact beforehand where Warren was saying, oh, you know, you you all I, I, you just have to concede on these uh, pro Wall Street appointments, appoint more progressives, etc. So because that agreement was in place, she chose not to run, um, as did pretty much everyone in the Democratic Party, because Hillary Clinton was seen as the the shoe in nominee, mm-hmm. and Bernie Sanders said, okay, I'm going to do it then. So why would he be pushing her to run in 2016 against another woman uh, if he really thought this was the case? Yeah. Now, I, you know, I, I'm hearing rumblings behind. Behind the scenes, um, from sources, is that a that's a very uh, adult journalistic thing to say? You need to have that, four of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> that both uh, campaigns really want to de-escalate. I would imagine Warren's campaign really does because this looks like it's backfiring on her, at least online. Although we're seeing the View and other mainstream outlets are just hammering Sanders over this. When, as you said, John. This is a this is hearsay. This is a conversation between two people from over a year ago, where t- we we know time manipulates conversations. Uh, how you interpret things doesn't mean it's necessarily the reality. Uh, I, when you have a a fight with a friend or an, uh, some sort of argument, it's always skewed in a specific way or just a regular discussion, and time makes it even more obscure. Yeah. And so I, I just don't trust her characterization of 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 this of this conversation and the fact that it was passed off as reporting when it's gossip at best um, speaks very very uh, poorly of CNN's integrity in this instance mm-hmm. and it, and the fact that it's it's just the number one topic yeah. is depressing and opportunism for CNN considering that they now have the stage at the debate so turning to the debate yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, Bernie and Warren. Um, what do you want to see happen in terms of how Bernie addresses this, if how Warren addresses this? Since this is almost certainly going to come up, I would guess probably the first question to Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, will be about this. I would love if they both just squash this immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and the onus is on Elizabeth Warren to do the right thing. She hasn't done the right thing thus far, that's for sure. Um, and. She knows that Bernie Sanders is not a sexist. And what's worse is that as his friend, she knows what implying that he might have a sexist thought does to him because of all of the heat that he unnecessarily took in 2016. And yet she's choosing to capitalize on that to further her own interests. Mm -hmm. And that's what bothers me most. So she's gonna have to squash this significantly to make up for what she she's done here. And really, it, the problem with Bernie and Warren eating at each other is that it really only helps the person who's leading in most polls, even Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. And Warren needs to put the movement before herself and realize that this behind the scenes squabble is entirely meaningless when we're faced with the reality that Joe Biden could be the nominee, the guy who voted for the Iraq war, the guy who took all that money from credit card companies and represented their interests, the the, the guy who pushed mass incarceration, who put, had a middle ground approach on busing, more anti-busing really, he was weird on segregation back Decades ago, I mean, the the all the baggage that Joe Biden has, let alone the fact that he's a gaffe machine that can't remember anything. Sorry, <laughs> going up against Donald Trump, that's the reality that we would be facing if Elizabeth Warren Elizabeth Warren is successful in what her advisors, I think, or or whatever she's she's trying to do here by going after Bernie Sanders. Um, the goal needs to be Biden can't be the nominee, and she has to put that uh, at the forefront of her mind. Yeah, I don't know that she will. I assume she'll say something like in her statement, you know, this is what I remember, but I don't want to focus on it. It allows her to put it out there again without seeming to be taking advantage of it. Bernie Sanders is in a tough place because to defend himself, he has to say that she is at least misremembering, if not outright being dishonest about what was said. 
to do anything else would not defend himself. And if he truly doesn't believe that that's what he said, then he has to imply that she's being dishonest. And so he will face consequences for defending himself in this case. And and I agree, Biden is loving this. I would say that Buttigieg is loving this. I'm sure Bloomberg is probably loving this. Biden, he had, finally there was an opening where he might have to finally answer for his dishonesty about what he was doing in the run up to the war in Iraq and afterward. And uh, and we have this situation with the tension with Iran where uh, issues of potential war are actually at the forefront of people's minds. But that now is not going to be a big focus. Um, and so this is, uh, I agree, I, I hate this entire thing. I know some in the media, they love the drama and they love being able to take sides. I'm not interested in that, I'm interested in Donald Trump losing later this year. And I think this makes that less likely. And the media's focus on it is gonna make it less likely too. Okay. Uh, and just quickly, quickly, John, just when when you hear people saying believe other women, believe women, you have to. That's co-opting language used for sexual assault, and it's completely irrelevant here. Um, this is not an instance where you have to just blindly believe women uh, about it. It's not the same, and it's offensive when they're co-opting that terminology. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll end on that note. Um, so stick around, uh, Emma, and everyone at home. Uh, we're gonna take a short break. We come back. Lots more to get to. We don't often comment on the damage report on the goings on on the view, partially because it happens like right before we go to air. But I do have to mention that you could not have expected anything other than what happened this morning. With the news of a Bernie Sanders Elizabeth Warren out there, they were of course going to comment on it. And they apparently launched into about 10 minutes of attacking Bernie Sanders and his supporters in fairly brutal fashion. We're not gonna show you the video, but Emma Vigland, who joins us once again, what do you think about the views take on Bernie Sanders? <laughs> I don't know. It's one of the most important political shows on TV, bear that in mind. I know, and um, a lot of people watch it, and a lot of people take it seriously. Although I do think people care a little bit more about the drama, you know, with Whoopi and and Megan and mm-hmm. all of that. And we're gonna have but, some of that in just a minute. But yeah, I, I think there's a huge disparity between what I'm seeing. Uh, is the response online, and that could just be because Bernie Sanders supporters are very online and, and younger, and so there's a a, a, a a more aggressive online presence. But I think there is a disparity with how traditional media figures and more corporate Democrats, centrists, are seeing this story with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, and uh, how people, regular folks in the world and the country, are responding to it. And I think that's exemplified by the very small snippets I've seen of that coverage. Yeah, yeah the thing that frustrates me is that I think I think it's weird that the View is like the biggest political show, but it is. And for a lot of people who like that's where they get their news. It matters what the stance of that show is towards a politician like Bernie Sanders because those people, if they watched Fox or CNN or MSNBC, they wouldn't get a good opinion of Bernie anyway, but they're not even going there. This is where they go. And if there's so much unified opposition from what is portrayed as the left on the show and what is portrayed as the right on the show, then it just makes the job that much harder for someone like Bernie Sanders to break through. So yeah, that's frustrating. At, at least they have Joy, right? Mm-hmm. Who's like the one voice of reason. Um, but but it, it it's it's yeah, it's tough sledding. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we turn to a little bit of View drama? Apparently, the View is going to be making a bit of a change up. Abby Huntsman announced on Monday that she's going to be leaving the show. This Friday will be her last day. She is going to be working on the 2020 campaign of her father, former Utah Governor John Huntsman. Um, what's interesting is that that is what she is saying is the reason. Perhaps it is. But other sources are saying something different. So, according to Brian Stelter and Oliver Darcy, Huntsman and Meghan McCain, uh, quote, were allies behind the scenes until recently, but their relationship soured over a recent di- dispute involving child centric chats on the show. McCain, who suffered a miscarriage, confronted Huntsman for bringing up her kids on the show. And Abby was apparently sick of being berated by Megan for perceived slights. She ultimately decided she didn't need this job and it wasn't worth it. So that's a mix of different explanations, but 
Look, everybody gets, even I, I don't watch the show and I get that these do not seem to be the best of friends necessarily, these four women. I, she can't talk about her kids because Megan McCain went through a horrible, horrible tragedy of having a miscarriage. I mean, that's, that's Looney Tunes talk. Um, I, I, I really, I, I, if that report is true, it's entirely consistent with the craziness that we've seen from Meghan McCain on that show. And the fact of the matter is that she feels like she's entitled to manipulate the world and the people around her as it is, as she sees it. Um, she's spoiled and it, it comes across. And that wouldn't entirely shock me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there's no way, one, you know, I, I I'm sure that Abby Huntsman wants to pursue op other opportunities, but she gets paid, I'm sure, pretty handsomely on that show. Mm -hmm. So it had to have been pretty bad behavior by Meghan McCain for this to go down. Yeah, you would think. Um, so look, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna throw a curveball at you. So she's transitioning out. If there is <laughs> news of who's gonna replace her, I haven't seen it yet. And so we have this little window where we could potentially affect them. And because it's such an important show, the woman who fills that slot is gonna be very important as well. Um, for the good of the nation, uh, if not the show, who would you like to see take her spot? Me. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, why? why, why do you I'd think you would make a good- ID, uh, I'm sure they paid me a ton of money and mm -hmm. I'd be progressive and I'd call them out. So, hey, you know, have me, have me on the view. I'll, that was a I'll, fast I'll, response. <laughs> what, what, John? That was a fast response. You were ready for that. <laughs> well, I knew the topics uh, ahead of time and mm -hmm. I thought about it. And yeah. there's only one candidate that would fit the bill. Yeah. Can, can I no. say who I think should, uh, should be on? Yes. Yes, yes, in so, all seriousness. In, in all seriousness, so, and, and this is what I was going to say. Um, I think it should be Emma Vigeland. I honestly do think that, and I was gonna <laughs> say that anyway. Like, I think Anna would be great, but I, we, Anna, Anna has to stay on the main show because I can't feel any more than I already am. But right. no, I think that you would be awesome. And, and look, I get what they'll say. They'll say, well, this is one of the conservative spots. You can't have a progressive in one of the conservative spots. Well, I will say, First of all, there's never been a progressive spot, so maybe it's overdue. But also, you've spent more time talking to Trump supporters than Meghan McCain has over the past couple of years. I think you have a better understanding of what they actually think and believe. Think about how amazing it would be. And you're, you're younger, you'd bring in a whole new demographic. That's why I want people to tweet at The View, hashtag Emma for The View. And let's make this thing happen, it's not impossible. It's not, and I live in New York, so mm. easy commute, easy commute, right? There is um, no reason not to have you on The View that I can come up with. Well, I might just like demolish everyone there, but uh, drama. <laughs> I mean that, I mean that uh, humbly, except for Joy, we'd be BFFs behind the scenes. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I look, it's. There needs to be more progressive voices represented on television, specifically on shows like The View that have so much reach. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of great voices out there. Um, people, you know, someone, Crystal has a great show on The Hill, and it's it was high time that she got um, a, a like a, a cable esque spot, Crystal Ball. But you know, she was on MSNBC for years, and look how long it took her to just kind of. Get, get this like more mainstream spot because the media just discounts progressives all the time. And now look at all the success that she's having. So it just goes to show that if you give a progressive voice um, the, the necessary resources and the more establishment kind of cable format backing, they're gonna be successful. So mm -hmm. The View really needs to take a page out of that book. I mean, the, the, like, uh, CNN finally started hiring at least one progressive. They hired Alexandra Rojas, but there needs to be more. Uh, this yeah. is a huge chunk of the country and progressive voices, progressive views are actually a majority of the country when you go issue by issue. There's no excuse for the, uh, that perspective not being more represented on television and they're aware of it. They yeah. just don't really care to change it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, uh, you know, when Anna's on Cuomo, the show is never better than then. And I think that they probably are starting to accept that. That not only does it bring in a new audience, but it just makes for better television. Um, and so again, that's hashtag Emma for The View. Send that at The View and we'll see if we can get this thing trending. Were you actually gonna do this? Is this why you wanted to do the segment? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> I think it's a I great idea. I was narcissistic and you were kind, mm -hmm. uh, but it evens out in the end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you just thrown out some other name, it would have made you seem humble and yet deserving. But now I still, I'm still, I got your back though anyway, uh, despite the fact All that right. you're uh, the most arrogant person I know. Um, okay. Right. Emma Viglin, as always, thank you so much for joining me. Everybody go check out her work, she does a great job over there. Thanks, John, feel better. Thank you, you too. Okay, another short break and then come back, a little update on the future of the wall on the southern border after this. One of the goals of the damage report is to make sure that we don't get so distracted by the big flashy shiny stories that behind the scenes we allow politicians to get away with terrible things and not face accountability. And so we turn to the wall where Donald Trump is continuing his quest to say, you know, go to hell to the legislative branch and to get the money that he wants to build the wall however he can. He's doing that. President Donald Trump is planning to divert an additional $7.2 billion from the Department of Defense in order to fund his wall along the southern border with Mexico. It would be the second time the president has ordered that funds allocated to the Pentagon by Congress be diverted for wall construction, effectively bypassing lawmakers in an attempt to unilaterally deliver on a campaign promise. So let's give you some more specifics. The Pentagon funds would be extracted for the second year in a row from military construction projects and counter narcotics funding. According to the plans, the funding would give the government enough money to complete about 885 miles of new fencing by spring 2022. Which is of course not the entirety of the southern border, but it's a good chunk of it. It's a lot more than he has currently been able to accomplish. And so what you're seeing now is, his frustration has grown year by year as he's been blocked from actually gaining access to those funds, even when he controlled both the Senate and the House. Republicans had unified control, they still didn't allocate the money. And so he has decided that the, that whole balance of powers and checks and balances thing, he's done with that, he's not interested in it. And any amount of money that he wants, even up to the tens of billions of dollars, he'll simply take it. Even if weirdly ironically, it's being used directly contrary to its stated purpose. So he says he wants it to stop immigration, but also the flow of drugs. And because he will not listen to the experts, he can't, he literally cannot learn. He still believes that the way that drugs come across the border is that people put them in a backpack and they walk across the desert. It's not true. If it were true, taking money from counter narcotics programs and building a massive fence might actually accomplish your stated goals. But that's not how the, the drugs actually make it in. Instead, they go through ports of entry. And this won't stop that from happening, but it will defund efforts to stop that from happening. So perversely, this actually makes it more likely that drugs will make it across the southern border. And think about the amount. The latest plans would bring the total figure for border funding past $18 billion. Will he have to answer for that? $18 billion, that's a massive chunk of fully funded free public education. Or Bernie Sanders' plan to cancel medical debt, that's a nice chunk of that. Think about the goodwill that would be accomplished by virtually any other use of this money. And what's interesting is I saw a feeling expressed on Twitter that is perfectly timely considering the debate that's coming up. So Andrew Lawrence said, one question I would like to hear at tonight's debate, since it's legal for Trump to take money from military funding to build his stupid wall, what would you redirect money from military funding to pay for? And that is a great question and a timely one considering the situation with Iran. We had Congressman Ro Khanna on and he said that the only way we could stop a war with Iran is to defund it, to simply say we're not going to pay for those offensive operations. But here's the problem, Trump believes that he can take money that's been allocated for other things in the Pentagon and put it wherever he wants. If he can do that for the wall and if the Supreme Court says it's okay, which they did last July, why couldn't he do that for another war or for rampant bombing or for buying drones or literally anything? So look, I think this desperately needs to be talked about, not just for the future of the wall on the southern border, which is important enough by itself, but for the precedent that's being set where the United States president can say, if you don't fund what I want, I will simply take whatever you funded and use it however I want. Screw checks and balances, that's what he's saying. Let's see how the potential future Democratic president, what they think about that precedent.
Okay, with that said, thank you so much everybody for joining me. Here's what would be nice as I cling to the last remnants of life with this sickness. If you could go on iTunes and rate and review the podcast, that would be excellent. I love reading those, we've gotten some great ones recently. I don't have time to go through them, but thank you so much for the people who've left those reviews. It is one of the nicest things that I get to see online on a given day, so if you have a minute, Please consider doing that, it would be great, not only for my state of mind, but also for the reach of the show. So with that, thank you for joining me today. J.R. Jackson joins us once again tomorrow, we'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Darola. I'll see you soon.